Coal collector. Based on the right, yeah. exactly. She she painted that on raw. She's a really good one. I, <laughs> I do. She interviewed me, but she didn't barely include me. <laughs> Judith was yeah. I spent a lot of time. With I took her to. The Hello, and welcome to Poxton Pros Bookstore. My name is Ramsey. I'm an event staffer here at Poxton Pros Bookstore, where we host in-person events along with partnered supported events, trips, and classes. We relocated both our branch locations at Union Market and the Wharf and have started hosting events there as well. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, poxtonpros.com. Before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. When we get to the time for opening the floor to your questions, we'll be passing around a microphone. Actually, nope, scratch that. We're going to have a microphone right here. So just come line up behind this pillar, and we'll get to your Q&As one by one. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. So if you have not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind the register at the front of the store. We ask you to line up, and we'll come by to ask you for personalization. So please have your books ready for us. Once the event is complete, we ask you to fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy. So now, without further ado, so I'm very excited to welcome author Sarah B. Franklin, celebrating the release of The Editor, How Publishing Legend Judith Jones Shaped Culture in America. Sarah B. Franklin is a writer, teacher, and oral historian. She teaches courses on food, writing, embodied culture, and oral history at the NYU Gallatin School of Individualized Study. She's an editor at the Edna Lewis and a co-author at the Phoenician Dinner Co Cookbook. She holds a PhD in food studies from NYU. She lives with her children in Kingston, New York. Sarah will be joining by Joy Yonan, the food and dining editor of the Washington Post, supervising all food coverage in the features department. He is the author of the best-selling book, Cool Beans, and of the upcoming book, Mastering the Art of Plant-Based Cooking. Without further ado, please welcome Sarah B. Franklin and Joy Yonan. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, hi. How's everybody? I thought you might be up. So I'm, oh, wow. I, know, I have a little reverb. I'm loud. Am I that? Am I really that loud? No, I sound really loud. OK. Just to yourself. OK, good. Um, I'm so happy to be here with Sarah. I don't know um, if anybody knows, but Sarah and I are actually almost, almost family. Almost family. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sarah is my brother-in-law's cousin. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, which we discovered after we started working. After together, we started I think. working together. Yeah, it was yeah. weird. Yeah, it was weird. So, okay, I want to start by asking you to name as many of Judith Jones's authors as you can think this of. Rapid fire. Just to just in case people don't understand the scope. Should we try to be chronological about it? Ooh, do that. Do that. <laughs> Um, well, Anne Frank, asterisk, um, Sylvia Plath, John Updike, John Hersey, um, Elizabeth Bowen, Langston Hughes. Are you counting, Joe? No. Um, okay, we're going to move over to the culinary side. Julia Child, Joe Nathan, who is here, Mater Jaffrey, Claudia Rodin, James Beard, MFK Fisher, Lydia Bastianich, Edna Lewis, 10,000 others that I cannot remember, um, Sharon Olds, Ann Tyler, um, an extraordinary, extraordinary list, uh, almost 60 years at Alfred A. Knopf. Amazing, amazing. So tell us how you came to this story. You wanted to, why did you even want to learn about Judith? When did you first <laughs> learn about Judith? So I grew up in a second with a second wave feminist mother who hated cooking, and I liked to eat. <laughs> and if you like to eat and you have a parent who won't cook for you, you're going to figure out how to eat well. And for me, that meant teaching myself to cook. And as a child of the late 80s and early 90s, I had at, at my disposal the early food network. And I would sneak home after school and start watching the shows and try to experiment with what I was seeing. There were a couple of cookbooks in the house, The Joy of Cooking, uh, Fanny Farmer, Moosewood. They never got used, but they were there. <laughs> so I played around with those a little bit. And then I used my very first paper check to send away for Gourmet Magazine, which I discovered at the check outline of the Grand Union. <clears throat> 
in suburban New York and started reading cover to cover every month. And that was sort of when I began to put together the dots of the who's who of the cookbook world. Mm. You know, the big names got mentioned in Gourmet. A lot of those people wrote for Gourmet from time to time. And I sort of was apprenticing myself to that world and began thinking privately I wanted to write about food because that's not a real job. So I didn't tell anyone <laughs> about that. <You're> right. <laughs> and so I went to school to study history, which felt very, um, you know, useful and practical, not at all, except for the 100 pages of notes that are in this book. Um, and it was while I was in school in Boston, I was wandering through a bookstore one day in, Boston, in Cambridge, and I came across The Tenth Muse, My Life and Food. And I had never heard Judith Jones's name before in my life, as many people have not, but the subtitle caught my eye. And I bought it on a whim, and I brought it home, and I read it in one gulp, and I realized that she was behind everyone who I had been learning from and who I had revered. And so she quietly became a hero of mine. Fast forward five more years, and I had just started a PhD program in food studies at New York University. And I was taking a course, an oral history course up at Columbia, and my professor took a break in the middle of our seminar, this three-hour class, and would check her email and ignore us all very handily. And I was always the food person in a room full of political scientists and anthropologists who thought I was ridiculous for studying food because one doesn't do such thing, right? Of course. It's beneath them. <laughs> and my professor was checking her email while I was trying to ask a question, and I was trying to get her attention. And at one point, She's tapping, tapping. She looks up and she says, you're a food person. You might be interested in this. And I looked over her shoulder at her laptop and I saw Judith Jones Oral History Project. Can you figure out how to help us? It was the Julia Child Foundation. 2011, Ju Judith Jones had retired from Knopf at 88 years old. And they had the foresight to try to figure out how to collect her stories, which really hadn't been um, documented in full. And I committed the sender's address to memory and shot off an email after class and said, I'll do anything. I'll be a research assistant. I'll, you know, I thought maybe I'd research for someone else and shake her hand at best. And four months later, I was in her apartment. So that's how it started in January of 2013. Man. So at, at what point when you're talking to Judith over the period of doing the oral history and maybe after, did you start to think that you had a book? I didn't at that point. Um, I, I realized very quickly that there was an awful lot she hadn't said in her memoir, that she had really skimmed the surface because she would start doing things like dropping stories about Updike and being in Ipswich. And I was like, wait, Updike, what, where was that in your book? And then she would, you know, extensively talk about her boss in Paris who overlooked the diary of Anne Frank and sort of a, a much more granular story than the one she had told in her memoir where was that? And mm. at, at one point she sort of side mentioned Sylvia Plath and I was like, what did you have to do with <laughs> Sylvia Plath? So, so I'm having all of these notions that there's a whole other side of her life that, that hadn't been told, but I was very, very young and I had, you know, I, I didn't think I could go near a story of that magnitude, but we became friends after we worked together for six months. We always cooked together. Before we did our interviews, she insisted. We never used recipes. She would take things out of the fridge, mostly leftovers, and we'd throw something something together. I think she was really testing me to mm. see how I worked in the kitchen, which, as I got to know her, made a lot of sense. She was always sizing up people's character. <laughs> um, and when I brought her the transcripts, thinking this is the last time that I will see her, she said, well, why don't you come for lunch? And it was the first inkling that I had that she maybe wanted to continue a relationship. And so we did until she died in August of 2017. And at her family and friends memorial service, which I had been invited to by her stepdaughter, that stepdaughter, Bronwyn Dunn, pulled me aside and said, I've just started to go through the apartment in New York and there's an awful lot of stuff. Would you maybe like to come and take a look? I had two 10-month-old twins at the time, and I thought, I am in no place. I was finishing a dissertation. I was putting my first book out to be taking on a project, but I loved Judith, and, and so I said yes. Um, and when I went to the apartment, there were two rooms full of letters dating back to the 1930s, letters she had written home when she was living with her grandmother in Vermont for a year, letters home from Bennington College in the 1940s when she was carrying on a love affair with Theodore Retke, who was her partner and then, her, excuse me, her professor and then became her lover. Uh, letters she wrote home from Paris in the 1940s and early 1950s. It was a historian's dream, marked up manuscripts, diaries, notebooks, mm -hmm. handwritten recipes, menu plans. And Bronwyn, with incredible trust, let me start taking the boxes home. And that's when I began to realize 
there's a book here. And, and this woman's story has just got to be told. Yeah. When you think about people's perceptions of Judith, um, what do you think the biggest misconceptions are? And what do you want to make sure people understand about her that they might not have? I think that assumes people have a conception of her to begin right. with, and I think most people have never heard her name. Um, that has begun to change with certain movies and television shows. <laughs> she sat in this bookstore in 2007 and corrected the record about Julie and Julia. There's this famous scene in that movie where she no-shows for dinner because of a rainstorm, and she sat probably right where we are now on her 10th Muse book tour and said, that never happened. Judith would never know right. show for dinner, especially because of a rainstorm. I mean, she was like unflappable. She was completely unflappable. So that is that is one of the things I would like for people to know is she was the least flaky person on the planet. She mm -hmm. had incredible integrity. Um, and, and I think the misconception, which for many people is the first conception, is being furthered by this HBO series that's, that's out. Season two is now out, which really presents her as a sidekick rather than a collaborator and an equal with her authors, um, she was really interested in working with her authors in a deeply collaborative, interpersonal kind of a way, which meant she wasn't the right editor for everybody. Mm. But for people who really relished intense revision and that kind of intimacy and being pushed to call more, to bring more out of the work, she was phenomenal, um, which is sort of exemplified by the number of authors who stayed with her for decades. So her integrity, her patience, her taste, her incredible mm. ability to read changes in culture before they happen, mm. to anticipate them, but also to push the envelope. You know, the, way, the ways in which she really wanted to bring about more experimentation with pleasure, both in food and sex, thinking mm. about Updike's fiction in particular, you know, she just couldn't accept that America was a culture that um, was, was so in denial of sensuality. And I think she was very astute in thinking that a culture that is that divorced from pleasure is a culture that is really uncomfortable with freedom. And I think that is really bearing out. Mm. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got to meet Judith pretty late um, in her life. And it was uh, around um, when she wrote about cooking for one. Um, and I was getting interested in that as a topic. And um, she came to the post and uh, we cooked together. And I think we we went to the farmer's market. We actually had some people come with us, some single cooks come with us um, and uh, get to ask her questions and watch her. And I think for me, one of the most revelatory aspects of your book, and I'm thinking about it because of what you just said, I sort of assumed that Judith was prim and proper. Everyone does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she wore Chanel for God's sake. Right, right. But she was, she was vivacious um, in her personality Very and her spicy. appetite. Very spicy. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about some ways in which that came out in, in her work. Yeah, I mean, I think simply the notion that, that one would cook for pleasure rather than for utility. At the time when Julia Child's book came out, even that was rather revolutionary. You know, we're talking about the mid-century the sort of height of pragmatic cooking, of mechanization of cooking, the rise of quick and easy foods, which she, you know, to her was the dirtiest of all phrases, quick and easy. Um, <laughs> she wanted people to get their hands dirty, not because they had to, but because they wanted to, because it was empowering to have control over what you put in your body and what you fed to the people around you. I mean, the kitchen is such a control center of a home. Um, and, you know, so I think this idea of being able to, to have autonomy over your life and over the people's lives around you through food is one way that that shows up indirectly through her whole body of work in cookbooks in particular. Certainly in the poetry of Sylvia Plath, the fiction of Ann Tyler and John Updike and the poetry of Sharon Olds, which are full of domestic life, the quotidian pleasures and the quotidian pains are rife throughout all of that work. She was really interested in how people lived. But fundamental to the way she lived was anchoring her day-to-day -day life in acts of joy and pleasure. I mean, this is a woman who read poetry aloud with her husband on a daily basis. Mm. This is a woman who went shopping for ingredients every day, who walked to work memorizing poems and speaking them out loud. I've had several people tell me stories about 
running into her and following her and thinking she's talking to herself. <laughs> and she was reciting a poem that she was trying to memorize, um, who was deeply in love with music, who skinny dipped until the end of her life twice a day. You know, she was just in love with life. Um, she loved to crack dirty jokes. You know, she sort of came around the side in a way. She always presented as prim and proper, and so it wasn't in your face. But once she warmed up to someone, she was so lively. She was so full of moxie. And, and that came about because she was paying attention to everyone and everything. She was really cosmopolitan and interested in the world. Yeah, it certainly seems like that was just an incredible feature of hers. Um, when you were talking to Judith, um, was her, how did, how did her, she, she died of complications from Alzheimer's. That's right. Um, how did her Alzheimer's affect your dealings with Judith, your conversations? She had not been diagnosed when I first met her. So that was January 2013. And in fact, my sense was that her long-term memory was remarkable, in incredible, which makes sense as an editor, right? Her penchant for detail, that she understood that to tell a good story, you needed granular specificity, right? And so it made sense to me that when she would recount moments in her life to me, she would go right for the interesting thing. Um, but that also when I pushed her to reflect more deeply, she could pull up emotion. Again, this is a woman who bathed in poetry and in fiction. She was always thinking about how things felt in the body, how they felt emotionally. Um, I didn't know that she was unwell, I would say, until late 2015. Wow. Um, so we had finished working together by then, but, but we were spending time together. So it showed up first in discombobulated phone calls. She was physically presenting as a bit more frail. Um, and then by the end of that year, Bronwyn, her stepdaughter, told me that, that they had received the diagnosis. But until that point, and actually for another six months after that, she lived alone into her mm. 90s. She did all her cooking herself. She walked her dog herself. She did her marketing herself. She went and lived on her mountainside house in Vermont, which is quite remote, by herself for four months out of the year. I mean, she was incredibly hale and hearty um, and did not want to be helped. I mean, she really prided herself on her independence. So, of course, Judith is possibly best known for her relationship with Julia Child. In fact, the headline to uh, I think the review in the post um, of your book like uses Julia's name. Uh, I wrote the obit of, of uh, Judith for the post, and you know, of course, Julia's name was in the headline. Um, what was their relationship like? Well, it was very long, and like any long relationship, it had chapters, certainly. <laughs> um, at the beginning, when they, when they first connected in 1959, it was by letter. And so the whole first year and a half almost of their relationship was entirely epistolary. It was entirely by mail, which I think was a great gift to both of them um, because it brought them immediately to a shared purpose, which was working on the book. And also, they got to know one another's styles on the page, which was, in fact, how they spent most of their time together. They were equally workhorses. They were both total perfectionists in terms of the, the written work, what they demanded of the written work. But they had different strengths. And so Judith knew the kinds of questions to ask and noticed every detail. And Julia was willing to do all of the work to make it better, which is certainly not true of every author. Not every author wants that. But but Julia was really willing to go through those draft after draft after draft of revision. And if Judith said, well, I can't find that kind of mushroom in an American supermarket, which Julia had asked her to <laughs> check and find out, Julia would say, okay, well, I'm going to revise the recipe then. You know, this is a book for American cooks. So there are beautiful letters between the two of them that I quote in the, in the book early on where they're sort of just um, thanking one another for their astuteness, for their hard work, for their level of observation, for their willingness to, to, to put in the hours, basically. They were doing this via transatlantic post. And then they went on to do many more books together. They spent a lot of time cooking together. They did have difficult moments later in their, in their time of knowing one another. But, you know, I think much like a long marriage, what, what sort of came out in the wash was an incredible respect 
for one another, they built each other's careers mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Judith was only two years into her time at Knopf when that manuscript came in, and she was still kind of a nobody there. Um, and, and there's a story that I outline in detail in the book. It was not a direct line to get that book published. She really had to find a workaround to, to get Knopf to say yes to it. And she also understood if she ever wanted to do another cookbook, Knopf again, she better make good on this one, which was a big risk. Um, and so I think they they always really felt that they owed quite a bit to one another in terms of growing each other up in terms of their professional lives. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up um, just the time period at Knopf because not only were cookbooks certainly not something that um, they had been interested in doing, Judith didn't even necessarily think that she was going to be working on, let alone known for um, working on cookbooks. She also had a lot of struggles at Knopf just as a woman um, at that point, even though Knopf was co-owned, founded by Blanche. Yes. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how, how she managed um, to, to navigate that world? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a really interesting part of the book for me to work on because Judith told me again and again that she was not a feminist. And so as a feminist, mm -hmm. to try to write a book that upheld and honored her power, but also honor what she had said to me was a really delicate dance. So whenever possible, I tried to really fall back on what Judith said to me and also things that I either had in print or from interviews with other people. Um, the things that really stood out to me were that she was underpaid throughout her career. I that mean, was shocking to me, those dollar amounts. Gallingly uh. underpaid. Um, asked for a raise only twice in her entire 57 years at Knopf, once directly to Alfred Knopf, who didn't deign to give her a response directly, but had his assistant respond and said, well, we'll give you a little more money, but could you entertain your authors a little more? And then it wasn't for 25 more years that she uh, went to Bob Gottlieb, who died last year. And, you know, that was only with encouragement from her husband, who had, for years had been saying, Judith, you've, you've got to ask for more pay. She was the primary breadwinner in her home. Um, but also because a colleague of hers, Betty Prashker, this really powerhouse at Doubleday, they had worked together in 1948. They shared an office in Doubleday and they had remained friends. When Betty found out what Judith was making, this was in the 70s at Knopf, she said, you've got to go ask Bob for a raise. You're, this is insane. You know, you're making millions and upon right. millions of dollars for Knopf at this point. With Ann Tyler, John Updike, and Julia Child alone, they were three of the best sellers on Knopf's list. And, and Bob Gottlieb denied her the raise, and she never asked for one again. She stayed until 2011. So Judith said things to me like, as a woman in publishing, you were kept down, and it was so matter-of-fact. There was not a women's bathroom available when she used to go to early um, publishing conferences with Blanche Knopf at the start. You know, it was just rife throughout the industry. And I, at the beginning, I wondered, you know, is this just sort of Judith? Is this Judith's sort of... Um, unwillingness to talk about money. She really didn't like to talk about money. She had strong values about it, but that was sort of a, a waspy value of hers. But the more I interviewed other people, the more it became clear this was something that everyone saw, but no one was willing to sort of advocate for. Yeah. Let me ask you sort of a bigger question. Um, why do you think Judith's, the cookbooks that Judith edited, why do you think they remain best in class? I mean, it's pretty remarkable, um, the number of cookbooks that she was involved in that were published decades and decades ago that remain standouts um, in their field. Why, why do you think that was? Yeah, um, I think there are a number of reasons why. In part, they were some of the first really thorough cookbooks mm. on the scene that were not merely manuals, but were trying to do multiple things. So they were trying truly to teach home cooks how to cook cuisines that they may never have encountered before, right? Which meant that the level of detail had to be so, um, it, the, there had to be so much sensual detail, so many cues that someone who may never have seen a certain kind of a curry before, right? Or who may never have tasted a green chickpea or who may never have smelled cumin toasting could replicate those flavors at home with written cues only, right? The early books had no photography, 
Right. Right. And this is before the advent of cable TV for most people. And so pe this, this is how people were going to learn to cook. So they had to be incredibly thorough. And Judith tested many of the recipes herself in the book. So she knew that they worked. So they work. They are incredibly detailed. Those things alone, as you know, as a cookbook author, automatically set them apart from yeah. an awful lot of the books that have been published in the last 20, 30 years. But also they were edited with a literary rigor, right? right? So Judith, at the same time that she was doing cookbooks, was also editing poetry, fiction, history. She was editing scholarly works. Um, and so she was she was tr she was using that same literary training, that same eye for precision lang of language, concise language, and distilled language, right? Making sure you cut out anything excessive so that it reads as distilled as a poem would. I think there's it's not a coincidence that her first loves and and her first sort of big um, her first landings at Knopf were a book of poetry, Sylvia Plath's The Colossus, and Julia Child's Mastering the French Art of French Cooking. The thing you have to do with language in a recipe and in a headnote is actually very similar to what you have to do in a poem, which is try to evoke an embodied experience in language. I think there are very, very, very few editors of cookbooks or in the food world in general who have that kind of literary sensibility and rigor that they train upon cookbooks. Um, so I think those are some of the reasons. Also, she sought out people who were so full of voice, yes. right? They had a story to tell. So they weren't merely teaching you how to cook a cuisine or to translate a cuisine, but they had incredible personality. And Judith really helped evoke that voice on the page. She insisted that it sounded as much like the person she knew as it could. And so that creates a kind of intimacy mm -hmm. that makes a book evergreen. Yeah, as soon as you mentioned that, my mind immediately goes to Edna Lewis, and um, you wrote, uh, edited an anthology about Edna Lewis. You wrote. I, I, <laughs> I, I wrote something for it. Um, but she literally pulled out that voice. Do you want to tell, um, tell people sort of how that came about and what sure. that showed about how Judith worked? Sure. I mean, that is a, that is a particular example, and I don't want to suggest that she worked exactly that way with all, all of her authors. I don't think she worked exactly any way with all of her authors. She was she really understood that different authors needed different things from her um, and wanted different things from her. But Enna Lewis uh, was a woman who was born in 1916 in Freetown, Virginia. She was the granddaughter of formerly enslaved people, and she learned how to cook from her mother on a wood stove in a farming subsistence community. And she ended up, as part of the Great Migration, moving first to Washington, D.C., and later to New York. Long story short, she ended up cooking in a cafe, Cafe Nicholson. She was a partner in that restaurant, actually. Uh, and she and um, the, the two fellows that owned that restaurant actually were in Paris at the same time as Judith was, and she met them in 48, but they didn't re-encounter them again until the 70s. In, in 1970, Edna Lewis was working as a caterer primarily in very wealthy white households. She had had a hell of a time holding down a job, and she was catering for, for really rich white people in New York. Um, and one of the people she had done a party for said, I think you should really do a cookbook. And, and they decided to write one together. It was called the Edna Lewis Cookbook. It never has sold very well. And as that book was getting ready to come out, the co-author, Evangeline Peterson, knew the then head of Penguin Random House. And she had contacted him and said, can you help us get this book out into the world a little bit? He said, well, I can't, but Judith Jones maybe can. Mm -hmm. She's the only one around here who knows anything <laughs> about cookbooks. And Judith invited them in for a meeting and sort of said, well, this book is at the printer. I can't do much for you. But they got to talking. And, and Judith was interested in people. And very quickly, Judith realized that Edna Lewis had another book in her that was about her childhood. That first cookbook was not at all. It was really Edna Lewis's catering. And it was a very global um, cookbook that was drawing from the pantries of, of the entire world, sort of way ahead of its time in a way. It's a wonderful book. Um, and so Judith was really interested in this next book, which was about growing food, gathering food. It was about family stories. It was a real revisionist history of freed communities in the American South that told a completely different history of America than anything Judith had ever encountered before. And she realized this was an unusual story that she hadn't seen anywhere else and that it would be really interesting to do it through food, that it might land with people who otherwise wouldn't listen to a different kind of American history. And so she commissioned the book, they signed a contract, and very quickly Judith realized that Evangeline Peterson, the co-author, was getting in the way. She was muddling Anna Lewis's voice. 
And so all three of them, to Evangeline's credit, she said, you're right. And she took herself on the contract, off the contract. And Judith and Edna worked on that book together for a period of years. Edna Lewis would write her notes longhand on yellow legal pads, and then Judith would type them. Um, and then come back to her and they would work out the revisions together. When it came to the recipes, Anna Lewis's niece typed them for her and herself never learned how to type. But they spent about four years working on that book together and, um, and really co-wrote it in effect. I mean, Judith was sort of the um, curator of, of that book and of the memories that Anna Lewis was putting down on the page and the recipes she was putting down on the page. Um, and it was a remarkable collaboration to the point where Anna Lewis dedicated that book to the people of Freetown, but also to Judith Jones for her deep understanding is the quote. Yeah. She, I think didn't, when they started, didn't she even say to her, just let's just tell me some stories. And then she sent Edna home, and then Edna would write them down. Put and it then, down exactly as yeah. you said it to me. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. She she really wanted head notes, particularly of books or little vignettes that that might fall between chapters, to sound as much like someone talking as possible. Because of course, that's when you're with someone in the kitchen. That's what it should feel like: is someone telling you a story right. about a dish or the first time they made it or what it makes them remember. Um, which for Edna Lewis were these beautiful stories of being in the fields with her father and walking behind the plow or the day that you make a certain kind of a cake that's in the middle of harvest or hog killing and hanging up a hog to, to be butchered and dressed and all the black history that's woven through that homecoming instead of Thanksgiving. You know, it was an incredible book that was released in the bicentennial year, which was a completely ingenious political power play by Judith Jones. It was written up in Time magazine in the bicentennial year, right? Think about the sort of editorial genius of that. Mm. She understood that cookbooks were these sort of Trojan horses that could get difficult politics in front of people who might, if you just sort of looked at the demographics of those same people on paper, might not give those people the time of day. Yeah, incredible. She was, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the other ways in which Judith was a tastemaker um, and culturally maybe ahead of her time because, you know, we food people tend to concentrate on the, uh, the food aspects of her career, which are formidable. Um, but she, she really shaped a great deal of how Americans thought about a good number of things. So can you tell us about some of that? Yeah. You know, I, I think she actually did an awful lot for American comfort around sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sylvia Plath's poetry is, is a piece of that. John Updike's Couples is maybe the most notable. She was writing, uh, he, excuse me, she was not writing. He was writing very explicitly about oral sex in that book in a way that scandalized the nation, but the book became a runaway bestseller. And in fact, there's a really interesting history that I detail in the book. We were still coming out of censorship laws when that book came out that had been on the books um, since the 1930s, right? And so she was all, and this is part of her mischievousness, I think, that you see showing up, is she would go, she would really come right to the edge of what was possible and permissible and see how far she could push that. And part of how she was able to do that was because she was behind the scenes. It wasn't her out front saying, now listen here, you should think about sex differently, right? She had someone else, someone mm. as charismatic as Updike, say, out in front doing it for her. But she was behind the scenes saying, yeah, go, go ahead. You know, giving permission and, and helping it sound beautiful so that people wouldn't think it was smut. Um, she edited Carolyn Helbrun, who is one of the foremost feminist scholars of the 20th century. She, she edited a book on androgyny and what she saw as the promise of androgyny. I mean, think about where we are right. here in mm -hmm. 2024 and the idea of, of non-binary gender, right? She was wor working on a book about that and that she published in 1973. Right. I mean, so ahead of its time. Um, and so in all these ways, again, from the wings, she was getting people to think about things with different attitudes and through different genres, which I think is part of why it worked, right? The people who wanted to come to those ideas through poetry could find them in poetry. The people who might only find them in cookbooks could find them in cookbooks. And the people who just wanted to read a novel before they went to bed could do that too. But she was part of all of that. Amazing. She Amazing. was everywhere. Amazing. Can you tell the incredible story of how she came across 
uh, Anne Frank's book. Oh, yeah, let's go back. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Just a little thing. I love the story. Um, <laughs> yes, so Judith left for Paris in 1948. She had been working at Doubleday. She had started there as an intern in college first, and then she was invited back as a reader. So she wasn't officially an editor, but she and Betty Prashker, the woman I referenced earlier who advised her to go get a raise, were sharing an office. They were two of only three women in editorial at Doubleday in a staff of 500 wow. at the time. The third was a cookbook editor. So it was a little Gosh. foreshadowing going on there. And Judith said to me, I didn't know anything about cookbooks at the time. Like she didn't give that woman time of day. But Judith found Doubleday and New York Publishing in general really dull, really dull. In fact, there's a quote in the book where she writes to Theodore Redke, her then lover, previous professor saying, New York Publishing is awfully unliterary. And, mm -hmm. and she was like, what? This is boring. I got to get out of here. They were also having a really tumultuous love affair. And so in the summer of 1948, she asked her boss at Doubleday for two months of unpaid leave. She had a cousin who was going to Paris, uh, was newly married, and so she sort of had a chaperone, an appropriate chaperone. And she and her best friend steamed across the Atlantic on the Volcania uh, and had bought themselves tickets to be in Europe for three weeks to sort of tour the continent. And she ended up staying for three years. She left her bag. This is a story she tells in her own memoir on the back of a bench in, in the garden one afternoon after a glass of wine and a heavy lunch. It had her passport, her ticket home. And uh, she took it as sort of an omen, a good omen that she should stay. She had really fallen in love with Paris. But she needed a job. She was from a, a well-to-do family, but they were not interested in her staying, so they refused to keep cabling her enough money to make her comfortable. And she also was really ambitious, and so she wanted to get back into the world. Many writers were in Paris in those years after the war. In fact, she, she has this letter sort of saying, there's more talent in Paris right now than there is in New York. No wonder it was so dull. So dull. They're all over here. Doubleday decided to set up an outpost in Paris and in late 1949, they, they set it up and Judith was hired as the secretary of the man they had appointed, this guy Francis K. Price, who Judith thought was a terrible bore and hugely untalented, but he was pretty charismatic and he was really there to court the American talent that was coming through and to maybe do a little bit of scouting. Um, but he would leave every afternoon. He'd go out for lunch and he'd usually stay out for drinks and then he'd, he lived in the same apartment where the office was, so he'd come home towards the end of the day. And Judith had started a literary agency, her own, <laughs> Judith, B, ba Judith Bailey and Associates, out of the office because that's how absent he was. So she was working with their typewriters and ink on the side while he was gone. One day he drops a stack of manuscripts on her desk and he had already passed them over as, as rejects for Doubleday and he asked her to write rejection letters for all of them. And one of them was The Diary of Anne Frank, which was coming out in France that summer. It had already been published in Holland and Germany and was coming out in French. And it had been sent to Doubleday for consideration for translation into English and publication in the United States. And Frank Price had passed it up. And so Judith was tasked with writing the rejection letter. He was out for lunch. She saw this iconic photo that we all know on the cover of the book. And she, just, she was captivated. And she took it over by the fire and began to read in French. And when Frank Price came home later in the evening, she stood up and she said, we've got to publish this book. And he said, this book by this kid? And she said, yes. And she made an extremely compelling case for why she understood immediately that the voice was so singular, right? That we so rarely hear from such an untarnished voice, but also as a historical document, there was nothing like it. Um, and in fact, he did send it on to Doubleday without any mention of her name. He sort of begrudgingly took a second look, and it became a publishing phenomenon when it came out in the United States in 1952. It made Doubleday huge amounts of money. It's still They're still getting royalties from that book. It's never been out of print. Um, and in fact, when Judith came back to the States in 1951, and the next year went in when it was published, sort of saying, you know I was behind this, right? They refused to give her a job. I have letters, I have letters that I found in her archive where she was writing to her husband who was off on a reporting trip. And she said, God, I wish to hell I'd edited the translation actually isn't all that good. But, but they knew, she said there were a couple of people who thought that she probably had a hand in it. They knew Frank Price wasn't really much of an editor and they figured she was running the show, but they still refused her a job. So, Toward the end of her life, oh, sorry. Make love to the microphone, they say. Um, do they say that? They do, yeah, they say that. Um, maybe I just say that. Maybe, maybe just you, Joe. <laughs> um, 
Toward the end of her life, did you get the sense from Judith about what kind of thoughts she had about the state of publishing and where it was going? Oh, yeah. And the state of... It wasn't even the end of her life. Oh, yeah. And and the state of cookbook publishing and where, yeah. where she saw cookbook publishing going? Yeah. What were some of those thoughts? Yeah, it was, it was nowhere near the end of her life. Um, there... It's starting in the 1980s, which was when the consolidation of publishing houses really began, and when Barnes and Noble really, and and at the time Dalton and Borders really began buying up independents. Um, there, there is letter after letter after letter of Judith writing to her authors, sort of bemoaning the state of things. Um, and for her, what that meant was she realized that she couldn't take the same kinds of risks that she used to, right? So so Judith's, many of Judith's books were not runaway bestsellers, but they sold steadily over time, right? Which for a publisher is very valuable. Of course, everyone wants a bestseller. But the next best thing is a book that just sells steadily over the decades, which many of her books, in fact, have and continue to today. Um, but, but she really understood that, that American publishing was losing something as it became more consolidated, more corporate, and more commercial, uh, because it meant that those books that might be a little more niche, which were the kinds of books that she was most interested in, were not going to be as appealing to her publishers, who were concerned most with the bottom line. So as publishing got bigger, the bottom line had to come up, up, up to support the kind of size, the runs that they wanted and things like that. Um, there's a there's a story that's told in detail in this book about Patience Gray's Honey from a Weed, which was a book, it's, it's an incredibly beautiful, elegiac book about a particular region, Puglia, in, in Italy. And Judith wanted very badly to publish it, but she knew that by the 1980s, she couldn't, that Knopf just would not let her do something like that anymore. Um, and she was terribly sad about that. And I think in a way she recognized at the time she was 30 years in to her almost 60 year career, but that things were beginning to change. And in a way, the golden era of cookbooks had kind of crested mm. by then. Um, she did make other moves to try to, to try to reshape things and kind of change the tides. The Knopf Cooks American series that she did in the early nineties was a big part of that. Most of those books didn't sell well. There were a few exceptions. The series as a whole did not succeed, but critics have looked back on it and really understood that she was so ahead of her time. I mean, what she was doing in those books, which was sort of outlining particular regions of American cuisine, particular migrant and immigrant cultures, how they adapted to particular ecosystems, the, the ingredients that might be available, how they've been taken up into American culture over time and adapted that's all we see in cookbooks now, yes. right? Yes. Um, and stories to go along with them. But in the early 90s, there wasn't a huge amount of appetite for that in commercial publishing yet. So she tried right until the end, but she realized that she was fighting an uphill battle. And and it's it's sort of devastating to read almost 30 years of letters where she's saying, you know, I, I see that we're working against the tides here, but I'm, like, I'm just going to keep trying. I just yeah. have to. So I get the sense that um, you spent a lot of time with Judith. You were uh, became friends with her in the course of working with her. I get the sense that she has been pretty impactful um, oh my God. in your life. So, can you talk a little bit about like what have you taken from Judith into your into your own life? Um, yeah, it's a it's uh, there was a there was a whole version of this book that got cut, which was really the story of Judas and my friendship um, that was that could fill a whole other volume. Um, but I had lost my mother not long before I met Judith. And I think unwittingly, I was sort of looking for senior women figures to sort of take me under their arm and you know, I think now I would say mentor me or just sort of guide me in a way, teach me how to be a woman, how I could be a woman in the world. But I didn't know that that's what I was looking for. But I learned an awful lot about how a woman could move in the world and also the ways in which you could push the envelope for yourself without permission from her. She never waited for permission from anyone mm. to do anything. Um, that, of course, is not unique to women, but I think I needed it from a woman in order for it to land. Um, I think a notion of patience and integrity and working on something over and over and over and over again until it is right, rather than just pushing it out into the world to get the paycheck, which of course is a huge privilege, but the idea of taking your work, whatever it is, very, very seriously, but also taking your play 
seriously, you know, that, that you should work and please yourself and the people around you in equal measure, that a life that doesn't have those held in balance is not going to be a good life. And that also you need the pleasure part to, to grant you longevity. I mean, no one had longevity, if not Judith Jones, both in work and in life. And I think that's because she walked away from the office at 536 every day. She didn't go to industry parties famously. She hated them. She didn't go to cocktails. She didn't take a lot of agent lunches. She took some when she had to, but she put work aside. She went home and cooked dinner with her husband. And when there were kids in the house for the kids they were raising together, and then she worked a third shift, but she was very protective of her private life and of her time. And I think increasingly in this world of social media and speed, where we're asked to live at a surface level and we're being pushed to move faster and faster and faster and put out work quicker and quicker, she's this really powerful reminder to me of that it's okay to slow down. And then in fact, in the long run, it's going to serve you very, very well to do so. And the work will be better and your life will be better for it. And a skinny dip. Always. <laughs> um, on that note, I think maybe we'll open it up for audience questions. So yes, we're, please. Um, <laughs> why, of course. Yeah. Of course. So we ask that people come up to a mic if, if able. you're able. Yeah. Um, if you're able, come up to the mic to ask your question because this is um, on a YouTube channel. Or it's going on to be. a YouTube channel. Yes. In perpetuity. Yes. Um, so, and if you if you can't make it up to the mic, just let us know. Or we'll repeat your question. Questions. We have one right here. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Yep. Um, so the first part was, how did I work with my editor on this book? And the second question was, do I think Judith will be the Maxwell Perkins? Is that who you meant? Yeah, of her generation. Um, they're two very different questions. I'll do my best. I um, This book was a very long time in the making. Uh, part of that was the pandemic, which slowed everyone and everything down. And I had young children during the time. So like many authors, I totally blew through my contract <laughs> by several years. Uh, this book was supposed to be out two and a half years ago originally. Um, it's really interesting. I have I had a fabulous editor for this book. Um, this the second time this book was actually under contract with a particular editor, and then we parted ways, and it's been with someone else for the last year and a half. And she wrote me a really moving letter a few days ago, basically telling me that this book, as a woman who has worked in this industry, has reshaped how she thinks about her career, and gave her voice to really validate the kinds of misogyny that she has been encountering from the start, the ways in which many of the things that she has wanted to publish have been dismissed in editorial meetings, um, and that she didn't realize. She had no idea who Judith Jones was. She, who has been working in the industry for over 20 years, had never heard her name. Um, to me, in some ways, that is maybe the greatest gift I could get from my own editor in this entire process, which is a feeling that it has helped her see herself in the world and make her feel that she has more ability to move freely and more audaciously in the world, which, you know, Judith did not consider herself an activist, but I do think that is something she would have wanted. Do I think she'll become the Maxwell Perkins? Well, that certainly would depend on whether there was a film made about her, right? So, you know, Maxwell Perkins had a movie made about him called Genius, which some of you may have seen, uh, which I think is a Awfully bold thing to do. Maxwell Perkins, for those of you who don't know, edited uh, the likes of Fitzgerald and Thomas Wolfe. Who am I missing here? Those are the two big ones that I always, the Hemingway. Oh, right. yeah. Those are the three, the three biggies. Um, and, you know, slim down their thousands of pages into, into readable books and rescued Hemingway from drunken time and ditches <laughs> and things like that. But, um, do I think she will? No, I think misogyny is alive and well. And so already uh, there has been, I mean, the, the, the not quiet misogyny threaded through many of the reviews of this book already suggests to me that a lot of people aren't ready 
to give Judith her due. Um, the cooking community adores her and, and was very ready to celebrate her long before the literary community was. I'm not sure the literary and publishing community is ready. Last week, two very, very powerful women editors were dismissed at Penguin Random House. Um, and to me, to have my book come out a week after that happened is, is really powerful because it suggests that actually very little has changed. And the narrative was the same. They needed to rearrange their finances. But who did they let go first? Two women who, who were really rising the ranks. Um, I would love to see her respected and and recognized in that way but i don't know that i'm that hopeful about how far we've come if i'm being honest about it well maybe the person you measure will carry it on You're maybe not. yeah that would be nice <laughs> i mean just the portrayal of her in popular culture so far with the julia and julia movie and then the hbo series doesn't bode super it's well it's not helpful right. it's really not helpful she's yeah she's a kid right Questions. Thank you. Hi. What? Hi. Um, so speaking about editors who've had movies made about them, um, <laughs> while you were speaking, I was thinking about Bob Gottlieb, and I, you know, I maybe bashful to be asking this question after the anecdote you shared. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, you know, the documentary came out, as you said, you passed away last year, and kind of as a phenomenon and the reception that got, I was wondering how that shaped your process in finishing up this book and how you're thinking about that. Um, and then second, if you think there's anything useful about putting their stories in conversation with each other, these long arcs over the 20th century and influential in their own ways, or if that's a question you hate and you think we should just focus <laughs> oh, on. Oh, no, I'm experience. ready. I'm very ready. Um, I was less ready last night when there were two Knopf veterans in the room and I started sweating when someone asked me about Gottlieb. Um, but uh, I, what I really want to tell you to do is, is read the book because um, the conversation that when I went to interview Gottlieb, basically what he said to me was, what are you doing here? I, and, and he just proceeded to talk about himself, which was very much the impression I got from everyone else, right? He was, he was an incredibly brilliant publisher and editor. There's no question. But he treated Judith like crap. And she knew it. And so did everyone else who worked with her. Um, and... People can be many things, right? Of course they can be. Um, but to, to suggest that we can't go near his legacy because he was good at the publishing part, to me, we need to do a bit better than that at this point. There's room in a life that long and a career that long for complexity. And I think it makes him more interesting. It, it, Judith deserves it, of course. That, I mean, I clearly I wrote the book, but I think it makes him more interesting if we can complicate him as a human, which is that he could be a phenomenal leader of Knopf when he was there and later of The New Yorker when he was there, but that he could also have been a shitty misogynist at the same time. Um, he almost threw me out of his apartment when I asked about his refusal to give her a raise. I mean, he, was, he felt obviously threatened. He was extremely upset by the questions. And then he went on record sort of digging his own grave, telling me why he didn't give her the raise, which was just remarkable. Basically, he told me, well, she had a rich husband. Well, it's neither here nor there, but no, she didn't. She was the only one earning a steady paycheck in her house. He also told me that he was a feminist before my mother was born, which is certainly not true because he wasn't that much older than my mother, that he hired women, he respected them, and if he gave everyone a raise, that his publishing house would have been broke. If he gave everyone a raise who asked for one, he would his publishing house would have been broke. But in the next breath, he told me, I never had to ask for a raise. Money was thrown at me my whole career. Mm. So the incredible audacity and also blindness of being able to say those things in a matter of five minutes to me with no compunction while a tape recorder is running suggests to me we have some looking to do. <laughs> and I've been um, uh, impatient and irked, I would say, that, that no one who's reviewed the book so far has been willing to even go near it. I, it shows me that they too are scared of going near the legacy because he's been lionized. Yes, can you come up? Are you able to come up to the mic? Thank you. That way. <laughs> or around front or around the back or. Thanks. Oh, come up, it's right there. Yep. <laughs> My question is short. It's why did she stay in Knopf? Because a really, an editor like that could have taken her writers with her. 
And certainly other publishers must have tried to woo her away from Knopf. She stayed decades. Why did she stay? That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's not coincidence that Judith stayed at Knopf as long as she did, and also she stayed married as long as she did. I think it tells you a lot about her character, right? Um, is there was something about her that was a mix of modesty, a lack of belief in her own ability to move, but also a deep sense of loyalty and commitment. She understood that her authors, many of them, wanted to be published by Knopf because it was the best in the biz, which was then, and to some extent, is still true today, especially in the literary world. They have a reputation as, as the best. Um, and she wanted to be part of the best, and she knew they did too, and that was valuable to to both of them uh, as author editor combinations. Um, so I think that's a part of it. She understood that the name Knopf gave her a certain amount of power to acquire, really. If she, if she wanted to go after a book, she could probably get it with the Knopf name behind her. Um, but again, this is not a woman who is an activist. And she was much more comfortable fighting on behalf of her authors than she ever was on behalf of herself. And I you know, I just don't think that she had the confidence in herself and in what she was worth to go after it and get it in an assertive way. It wasn't who she was. I mean, in our very last interview together, which was not our last time spent together, I really wanted her to go on record and take credit for how phenomenal she was, how much impact she had made. And she wouldn't do it. And it was driving mm -hmm. me mad. I was just like, just say it for the tape, you know, <laughs> just please. <laughs> Um, I was so desperate for it and she wouldn't take the bait and she wouldn't take the bait. And she finally said to me, you know, I think I'm just inherently modest. I'm not that impressed with myself. I worked with some wonderful books with some wonderful authors and it comes down to luck that certain things came my way. I vehemently disagree with that, but it, it seemed to me that it is how she felt to some extent that, that she knew she worked hard, but she also believed that things came to her and that that was some kind of cosmic kismet that you can't quite always describe and that she wasn't going to divert it. She wasn't going to, you know, try to take it somewhere else because the magic night might not quite replicate. Um, but I think also, again, as a product of her time, that it just would have been really hard for her to make that kind of a bold move. It wasn't who she was. Yes. Hi, this has been <laughs> really there. enjoyable. Thank you. Um, in the list of gold-plated names that you mentioned at the beginning as being her authors, the one that surprised me was Langston Hughes because I, to my knowledge, he had a pretty good career going at the crisis and was a fixture in the black community. And I was just curious about when Judith Jones kind of interacted with him and what role she took in his career. Thank, I love that you asked that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Blanche Knopf brought Langston Hughes to Knopf. Uh, she was... She was really famous for being a scout. Um, and she brought lots of Harlem Renaissance authors to Knopf, he being one of them. Blanche Knopf handed Langston Hughes to Judith to edit, and she edited his collected poems towards the end of his life. So that was her mark on his work. And she has edited several, She, I say that like she's still alive, she edited several more books um, about him after long after he died. She edited all his Zelda works compiled. Anthologized. Most books were not, this is really, it's an interesting thing that, that I try to trace through the book, but many of the authors that Knopf was publishing and that all publishing houses were publishing up until the 1940s published, were published as they came in. So editors' roles really began to change after World War II into more shapers of literature. Previously, a manuscript came in and that is what got printed, often verbatim. Questions? Hi. Hi, Joan. <laughs> we have royalty in the room, everybody. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to commend you on the work that you've done. It's a beautiful read, and just you did a terrific job. Thank but you. I do have a question. How much, when you talk about her, want, when you think that she deserved more, I, I get the same take on it. Judith grew up. She, her family had a certain amount of money. They've got real estate in New York. She didn't have to spend a lot of money. She didn't, that's not really what, I don't think that really what drove her. And her husband had a certain amount of money too. He, he did not. He did not. 
Well, in a way, that didn't matter. She did. She knew what she had. And she, she also was very, very loyal to everybody at Knopf. And she, if they were like family. You know, Bill Koshland, and she, they were, it was a, a, a wonderful place when she was there. And I, 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 you know, I, I listen to you, and there, you've got the values of a feminist. And I'm not sure she really was thinking like that. No, she and, wasn't. And so, and I, and I'm, it was something of the time. But she, she, I mean, you know as well as I do how she didn't like to spend any money. And she, <laughs> I mean, I remember once um, she had worked at Knopf for 50 years, and she invited me to go with her. They gave her two first class tickets to Europe plus dinner at a three star restaurant. And actually I told her this in my new book. And she, um, we went, I forget, a lot, I forget what it's a, what's the restaurant in Alsace, the three star restaurant in Alsace. Anyway, we went there for dinner. Delil, oh, Delil. Eelhauser, right. We went there for dinner, and she insisted on getting the prefix for that day so she, that Alfred Knopf would not have to pay for that it. That sounds like Judith. So, <laughs> you know, th this is the kind of person she, she couldn't leave what she was. And I think that she was so grateful for them giving her um, Julia Child that she would never leave them. You know, that, that uh, yeah. So, she she thought of different things throughout yeah. her life. Yeah. Um, it just was a different way. But anyway, that's I want to just w ask what you think about that. No, I think you're right. I mean, on all accounts, Judith hated spending money, and she was pretty uncomfortable with having it. And so, not having a lot may have been in a way helpful to her because then she didn't have to deal with it. I do have a different perspective as someone who is 60 years younger than she is and as someone who identifies as a feminist. But I think to suggest that we should be so grateful just to be in the room and therefore should not ask to be compensated equally at this point is simply a ridiculous notion. And I think it was ridiculous then because she was one of their top earning editors and they knew it. You know, I think there is no way that you can argue that they did not understand her worth. And the fact that they saw it and refused to compensate her properly, to me, is unforgivable. She didn't say that. I want to be very clear. She never said anything of the sort to me. That's my feeling about her. And it's not like she never asked. Um, That's right. Right. To ask and be refused is quite a thing. Yes. Anything else before we break and sign some books. Maybe one more. All right, let's break and sign some books. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>